Module 5, Adding and Configuring Web Pages. In this module, we'll define what a web page is. We've already had some hands-on experience with it in Module 2, but we'll dive in a little bit deeper to talk about what pages really are. We'll also get into creating web pages, what types of pages are available, and how do we interact with them. We'll talk about managing web page content and utilizing web parts. There's a lot of really cool stuff we'll talk about here, but all of it is going to revolve around the user-facing side of SharePoint, web pages, where we'll add context to content. Web pages are bar none the most user-facing part of SharePoint. It's where we go to take all this information that we generate in SharePoint and display it in such a way that users actually understand what they're looking at. You'll hear me say it a lot, but it's true. It's where we go to add context to all this content that we keep adding in, whether it's in lists or libraries, all this data that we're generating is just data until we tell people how to use it. And hopefully you're not banking on them all sitting through these videos in order to understand how it is that they're gonna just work in SharePoint. Sure, you'll sit through these, because you've got to understand how to manage that content and create the places where this data will go. But the average user just wants to know how to upload a file or what to do with all the files they're currently looking at. So in this example, this is my homepage for Project Central. You'll notice that I've got a little bit of text telling users where to go to get started. Check on the left for shared resources. Check below to find the latest announcements on our newest projects, and if you're looking for the information on a specific project, you'll find the names of all current active projects at the top of the page. So right out of the gate, even if a user's never been to this site before, they suddenly have some context for what it is that they're going to be doing or where it is that they need to look to get to where they do need to go. So here's a good example, central announcements. This is a list stored somewhere else in SharePoint being displayed on this page using a web part. Just as a quick reminder, web parts and app parts display content stored either in SharePoint or outside of SharePoint on a page so that we can add context to it. To view all your pages in a SharePoint site, you'll need to go to site contents. So go ahead and click on the gear here in the top right hand corner and go to site contents. Now, believe it or not, Pages are actually a type of file, just like every other Word document, Excel spreadsheet, and so on. And where do all documents get stored? I'm sure I heard you. You're right, libraries. So sure enough, there's the site pages library. Every SharePoint site has one. You just have to know where to go to find it. So I'm gonna go ahead and find my site pages library, and I'm gonna click to jump in. Go ahead and pause the video and find your site's site pages. We'll see you after the break. So it's here inside the site pages library that we're able to see all pages that exist within a site. Even if they aren't linked anywhere else, pages that exist, even if they've only just been created, can all be found here by default. Now remember, pages are just another type of file, so everything you know about libraries can also be applied here to pages, meaning version history, content approval. All these different instances of things are available when it comes to managing pages. To create a new page, you have a couple of different options at your disposal. One of the easiest ones is if you click on a gear in the top right hand corner, you might have noticed the option to add a page. The problem is add a page only gives you the option to create one type of page, what we call a publishing page. So if I were to go ahead and click on add a page right now, it just jumps right in and gives me a publishing style page. Well, that may not have necessarily been what I want to use. So instead, I'm gonna go into my site contents, site pages library and click New. By clicking on the new dropdown, you'll see I have access to more than just the site page or publishing page. I also have access to 
wiki pages, and web part pages. So let's talk about all three of these here. The newest is the site page. The site page has never before existed in previous versions of SharePoint. While the style of page, the publishing page, has, that functionality has been merged with the site page. We'll talk about what that functionality is in just a little bit. But the most important thing to know is that the site page is Microsoft's new modern twist on the web page. So it doesn't have the ribbon-based interface. It's also a lot more dynamic. So we'll see that in just a moment. The web part page is the oldest style of page in SharePoint. So from 2010 SharePoint all the way back to the earliest stages of SharePoint, the only pages that have existed previously have been web part pages. So you might be aware of the two different ways to put lists and libraries into a site, web parts and app parts. Well, the web part page was the only style of page that existed before there were even app parts. It was just web parts. In 2013, Microsoft introduced the wiki page. Of course, wiki means quick. So the wiki page is designed to be a lot more user friendly than the web part page. And it's the first style of page that was designed to incorporate app parts as well as web parts. So these are the three styles of pages. We're not gonna dive into all three here, but we are gonna give you some working knowledge of interacting with wiki pages and with site pages. So let's go ahead and jump into the wiki page. I'm gonna go ahead and create a new wiki page. When you click on new wiki page, it asks for a new page name and we'll go ahead and give it the project documents. Now you could follow the rules that we've talked about in previous videos. Camel case, no space, no special characters. But the reality is that outside of special characters, page names are a lot more flexible. They're a lot less sensitive to character limitations because they themselves are just a file. So in this case, I am going to put a space. You don't have to, but you also don't not have to. I'm going to go ahead and click create. Now that I've created that page, it's instantly dropped me into the edit interface. But I'm going to go ahead and click on save just so we can see what a blank page looks like. So here it is, my project document page. Remember, you can see all pages, even ones that have just been created, by going to site contents, finding the site pages library, and there it is. Go ahead and pause the video and create your first wiki page. And join me back here. Welcome back. To edit a page, simply go into Site Pages and click on the name of the page. We want Project Document. There we go. So in this case, I'd like to edit this page. To edit the page, in case you didn't see earlier videos, you have three different options at your disposal. You can either click on the gear in the top right corner and choose Edit Page, click Edit in the top right corner, or click Edit underneath the Page tab three different ways to edit a wiki or web part page. So using any of those three options, go ahead and click edit page. You'll know you're in the edit page interface because you'll have access to the format text and insert tabs. Bear in mind that if you're in a web part page, you may not have access to the format text tab. One of the first things you're gonna notice when editing a page is that by default, it's just kind of one big block. Now, of course, you can just start typing right out of the gate. This is something you weren't able to do in web part pages. The whole point of wiki pages is the ability to say, I want text there, I'm going to put text there. And likewise, the ability to insert any number of different things like pictures and videos. So there's a lot more flexibility with wiki pages than there have been in years past with web part pages. Now, of course, there's not a lot of structure with this single column interface. So you can add more structure utilizing the text layout dropdown here in the format text tab. 
by clicking on that drop down, you'll see one column, one column with sidebar, two columns, and so on. So go ahead and find the text layout structure that you want. In my example, I'll go ahead and choose two columns with header. And you'll notice that I get exactly that. Two columns with header. Now don't worry about the lines that appear here while we're editing the page. Those lines are just to show you where we can put content. So I'll go ahead and add a title. I'll say, welcome to the project documents page. And I'll go ahead and make it look like a title. There we go. Now what I'd like to do is here on the right hand side, I would like to show a list of all the documents that are currently located within the project proposals library. So in order to insert that web part or app part, remember both web parts and app parts can pull data from inside a SharePoint site. I'll need to jump into the insert tab and select either app part. If I know exactly where it is here in the app part view or web part, and then go to the apps category and choose from that list. So I'm going to go ahead and find my project proposals library, place my cursor where I would like that library to go and click add here on the right hand side. And there it is. So there's my project proposals library. Go ahead and pause the video and get to this point, change the text layout, add a title and using the insert app part or insert web part, select a library and insert it into one of those locations. If you do insert it into an area that's not necessarily where you wanted it to go, don't worry. All you have to do is click and drag and you can move it to other locations. So if you accidentally added it to the header, simply click and drag from the title of the block where you want it to go. Go ahead and give that a shot. We'll see you after the break. It's time to add a little bit of context. Remember, the whole point of a page isn't just to give them the data, it's to explain why that data is there and how they're expected to interact with it. So I'm gonna go ahead and click in the left column here and I'm gonna say something to the effect of, on the right, you'll find the latest project proposals. Click on the dot, dot, dot to the right of any proposal. So what do we wanna do? We might tell them to click on the ellipses and click open to open a copy of it and click open to access the latest copy of that proposal to download a copy. And you guys can see that I'm going ahead and I'm adding more and more context that explains to the user what it is that they might be expected to do. So I might say to download a copy, click the dot, 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 click the second set of dot, 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 and select download. And finally, we'll say to upload a copy, simply drag and drop your proposal over the project proposals window. It's that easy. So I've now explained to the user things that they otherwise would never have had any working expectation to have known. Go ahead and space this out a little bit. A word to the wise, try to avoid clumped up text. Users like to read in fragments. So squeezing a bunch of text together can really make it unlikely that the user is going to read these or perceive them to be helpful instructions. And finally, just to polish it off, I'll go ahead and insert a picture. And I'll go ahead and choose from computer. I happen to have a file just for such an occasion. Now keep in mind, if you already have a file uploaded, you don't have to go through these motions. If you don't have a file uploaded and you do choose to upload it, 
The destination library by default is the site assets library, which you can find here in the gear in the top right corner and going to site contents. So I'm gonna go ahead and click okay. Keep in mind that if you did already upload this file and you wanna use it again, when you click on insert picture, choose from SharePoint and go to the site assets library of the site that you're currently in. In this case, I would go to site assets and site pages. And there's my project document library. And there's that image that I already uploaded. So it uploads it into a folder named after the page you're currently working in. So you can still use this later if you need to. So go ahead and do that. Add a little bit of context, upload a picture, and we'll see you after the break. When all is said and done, and you're done making changes to your wiki page, at least for now, remember to click Save, either by going to the Format Text dropdown or the Page tab and clicking Save, or by clicking Save here in the top right corner. All of those will save your changes, and you'll get to see what your page will look like to users as they visit. So there you go. So you'll see that the header in two column allows us to provide a little bit of structure at the top, a little bit of context on the left, and a little bit of action here on the right. Not bad. If you need to make changes, remember, simply go to the page tab once again and click edit. You can view the history of a page as you've made changes to it by clicking on page history. By clicking on page history, you can actually see changes as they've taken place between versions. Simply compare between what two versions using this drop down here on the left hand side. You can see that between the last two versions, we've had new text added. If I scroll down, you'll even see that this picture is counting as that new text as well. But I can also compare it against version 1.0, if I should so choose. So it's kind of interesting to see what kind of context you can gain from seeing what changes have taken place between one version and another. It is important to note that you will not be able to see changes between web parts or images or any HTML formatting. So it is a lot more predominantly focused on text and context, but rest assured that this does provide some pretty unique insight into where it is that you're operating. To get back, either click the home page or Click the Pages library here in Site Contents. Go ahead and check your pages, page history, and then join me back in the Site Pages library. Welcome back. So now that we've spent a little bit of time talking about creating a wiki page, let's shift the conversation over to Microsoft's newer style of page, the Site Page or Publishing Page. This is the style of page that we get when we click on the gear and select add a page. In this example, however, we're gonna go ahead and click new and site page from the site pages library, just to be definitively sure this is in fact what we're getting. So site pages were designed to be much more dynamic, much more user-friendly. There's still a work in progress, however, so it is important to be clear, not everything you can do on a wiki page is possible yet on a site page. Nonetheless, we'll go ahead and name our page. In this case, it'll be site documents. So we'll broaden the scope a little bit. We'll say not just limited to any one particular library, but documents across an entire site. Now that we've titled that, you'll notice down below the title is a little plus icon. You'll also notice that unlike the wiki page, there are no tabs. So we are a little bit more limited with regards to what this page is capable of. An additional side note here, all changes that you make to a site page are saved instantly. However, they are not published instantly. So you're a lot more iterative. There's a lot more of a work in progress feel to site pages. Go ahead and pause the video and create your site page and join me after the break. So now that we've got our site, it's time to add a little bit of content to it. Now you might notice that we didn't click edit a page to get here. You'll notice that there's no ribbon tab to click edit page on. If I click on the gear in the top right corner, 
There's no edit page. And I don't see edit page up here next to share or following. So the process of editing a page and likewise with most of the modern interface with lists, libraries, and now the new modern pages, the tools we'll interact with largely can be found here in this little section or in the actual interface. In this instance, to add new content, simply click on the plus icon. You'll notice that you can choose text, images, document. Now keep in mind that says document, not documents, meaning you can actually display specific office files on a page. You can put links, maps, embedded HTML content. In our example, we'll choose highlighted content. So highlighted content is actually this really cool web part that pulls data from all over the site and displays it here. So you can see it's pulling from all sorts of different libraries right now. What I'd like to do, however, is not have it pull from everywhere, but have it pull from specific areas. To have it pull from specific areas, I'm going to need to edit this element. You'll notice when I hover over this web part, it actually gives me a little pencil icon. Simply clicking on that gives me a little pane out to the right hand side where I can pick and choose what comes from where. So I can say either this site, this site collection, or all sites that a user has access to. We'll keep it narrowed down to just this site. We can specify what kind of content types we look for. We can even get more specific and add even more content types. We can narrow it down to specific styles of documents within that content type. Let's say for the sake of argument here, I only want to see Word documents. You'll notice now that this has been contextually updated to show just Word documents. If I scroll down, I can even sort and filter based on specific metadata whether it includes certain words. So let's say that I want to include only stuff that contains the word lorem, which if you might've noticed, most of these have the word lorem, Latin. And I can even choose how I sort it, whether it's by most viewed, what's trending currently, meaning which one has the most amount of views and the least amount of recent time. And I can even specify how it displays it. Carousel is a fun one. But list is also a really creative way to do it. In this case, I'll choose carousel. And finally, I can even go so far as to say, hide this web part if there's nothing to show. When all's said and done, and you don't want to edit it anymore, just click the X. All those changes that we've been making have been made in real time. All I have to do now is click save and close in order to see those changes that I've made. So there we go. Now I'm getting real-time previews on all these documents that are currently stored. Of course, most of these documents don't have much of any text, but you get the idea. Keep in mind that just because I can see these doesn't mean that other people can. You see, a site page, any changes that you make are saved as drafts by default. In order to make sure that other people can see these, you'll need to remember to click publish. We'll go ahead and add a little bit more content to this before we publish, but remember that that means that you can create a broad, expansive work in progress without having to worry about upsetting users by taking things away and adding new things, and every time I reload it, something looks different. Instead, you can publish changes when they're ready to be published. Go ahead and get this far. Edit the page, add a highlighted content web part, and customize it based on your specific needs. And join us after the break. Welcome back. Let's add a little bit more content here. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna click the edit page button, again, here in the top right portion of the screen. Having clicked edit page, I'd like to add a little bit more content. Maybe I wanna put it at the top portion of the screen. To add it to the top portion of the screen where the current highlighted content box is, I simply have to hover over that area, and you'll notice the plus sign line appears. Of course, I could also scroll to the bottom and I'll find it there as well. In this instance, I'll go ahead and give it a click and I'll say I would like 
to give an image gallery. Now, when I click image gallery, it'll actually ask me to choose which images I'd like it to cycle through. Now, this is a great way to pull content from all sorts of different picture libraries, but I'll go ahead and just choose a couple that appear here. And I'll click open. Keep in mind, you can customize all of this later after the fact. I'll go ahead and give it a title, Company Pictures 2017. And if I want to go even further, I can click the little Edit Configure Element Pencil. And from here, I can specify, do I want it to be tile-based or a carousel, just like the images that I saw here with my preview pane. To add more pictures later, simply click Add. And likewise, if you'd like to edit the details of any one particular picture, you'll notice once again the pencil icon. This is where I can add a title for the picture and even give it a caption. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And I'm going to customize this highlighted elements feature to instead of showing it in a carousel like the picture, I'm going to give it a list. And instead of trending documents, I'll call it useful project data. It's pretty incredible how easy it is to customize site pages. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. I'm going to go ahead and click save and close. Remember, we could have easily added text to this. If I wanted to, I could have edited the page, clicked on the plus and said text. That would have been useful if I wanted to add a little bit of context, like here, for example. So I might say, below are some project files. Click on the name to view the file. And I can even say what type of text it is. By highlighting it, instead of normal text, maybe I'll say it's a heading or a heading two. So it's pretty interesting to see all these different bits and pieces of flexibility here. You're by no means limited. The process is just a little bit different compared to wiki pages. Finally, I'm going to go ahead and click save and close one last time. See my work in progress. Not bad. Look at the text and even interact with some files. When all is said and done and I'm ready for this page to be published, I'll simply click Publish. You'll know it's been published because instead of saying Draft Saved At, it'll say Published. Go ahead and pause the video. Add a couple of more elements to your site page, save it, and then publish it. So that was a quick introduction into the styles of pages and how to edit them here in SharePoint Online. Now, just as a quick reminder, when it comes to creating new pages, you can click the gear and select add a page. However, that's only going to give you a site page. So if you're not ready for site pages or alternatively, if you like the flexibility and power of a wiki page, you'll need to go to the site pages library here in site contents and then click on new and choose the style of page you want. As a secondary reminder, there's no need to create a web part page. That's simply a legacy style of page that Microsoft continues to support in case your organization calls for it, but it is the least flexible of the two. We've seen the benefits between wiki pages and site pages. Wiki pages, of course, are flexible and powerful and all encompassing in terms of adding that context to content. Site pages, on the other hand, we saw were much more dynamic and when they come together, they look great. But that said, depending on your specific organizational needs, you'll have to decide which one makes the most sense. There's not a better or a worse, it's which one makes sense. Now, as one final note here, as you start to create these pages, you might decide, hey, this page looks so good, I want that to be the home page. You can easily make any page the new home page by simply selecting the page clicking on the ellipses at the top in the site pages library and selecting make home page. You can also do that with really any other page, whether it's a site page or that wiki page we saw earlier, 
And if I were to go ahead and make that the home page and click home, you'll notice that home now takes me to the project documents page. And if I want to fix that, I can simply go back to that, find the page that was the original home page, select it, and make it the home page. It's that easy. Click on home, and we're back to home. Not bad. Go ahead and pause the video, and if you'd like, experiment with making pages the home page. We'll see you after the break. Welcome to module six, managing site and list security. In this module, we'll talk about understanding security as it exists in SharePoint. That means understanding when you do have permission, what do you need to expect? And when you don't, how can you tell? We'll talk about permissions groups and levels and how you need both in order to effectively administrate a SharePoint permissions structure. We'll talk about the difference between assigning permissions on a group versus an individual's level. We'll discuss creating permissions groups. We'll talk about adding those users to groups. And finally, we'll talk about breaking and reinstating site permissions inheritance. So a lot of really cool stuff to talk about here. Let's go ahead and get started. So let's talk permissions. Permissions in SharePoint are without a doubt one of the most fundamental things to understand about working in a SharePoint environment. Without permissions, you can't do much of anything. Likewise, permissions allow us to decide who has the ability to upload files, but also maybe not edit them. Or likewise, the ability to upload and edit existing content, but not delete anything. So permissions are capable of doing a variety of different things, but it's important to understand how permissions actually function in order for us to effectively apply them. One of the most important things to know about permissions right out of the gate is that if you don't have any permissions at all, you cannot access content. It's a lot like parenting. For those of you with kids, if a kid says, you didn't tell me I couldn't do it when they get in trouble, is that a valid excuse? Even if you didn't tell them, there are some things that are just, they're wrong. They're not allowed. So in that same vein of conceptualism that we talk about permissions, which is to say, if I don't say yes, the answer is no. So right now I have full control. I have total permission over this site. I know I have full control because if I click on the gear here in the top right corner, I see a few different things that tell me I have full control. I can edit a page, create a new page, add a new app, like a list or a library. I even have access to site settings. And if I go into site settings, the settings that I see tell me I have a lot of control. You see, Microsoft's a big believer in, if you can see it, you can do it. So if I could see any of these right here, like I can right now, that means that I can do it. But if I can't see these things, and likewise, if you were to go into your site settings right now and compare it against mine, anything you can't see is a missing permission. It's something you're not allowed to do. So it's really easy to identify what kind of power or control you have in a environment, in a site, in a list, in a library, by what you can, or more importantly, what you cannot see. So go ahead and take a look around your site and check to see what you can and can't do compared to me. Do you see all the options in the gear? Go to site settings. Do you see all the same categories that I do? Jump into a document library. Do you see the ability to create a new file or upload an existing file? If you don't see these buttons, you're missing those permissions. Go ahead and pause the video and explore. So I've logged in as a user with slightly lesser permissions. Let's take a look at how things look different as compared to ways they were before. I'll go ahead and click on the gear in the top right corner and you'll notice right out of the gate, I'm missing a substantive amount of permissions, the ability to add a page or edit this page or add an app. I definitely don't even see site settings, meaning that I have access to none of those settings. Let's jump into a document library. You'll see this time around, I don't see new or upload. If I select a file, I can open it, but I can't edit it. So I'm missing a lot of the features that I had in a previous permission structure. So again, it's this idea of if you can see it, you can do it. And even compared against just these two libraries, this is the same library logged in as two separate users. 
you'll notice the amount of permissions I have in one versus the other, it's a pretty stark difference. So if there's nothing else you take away from this particular part of the lesson, let it be. If you can see it, you can do it. And if you can't see it, SharePoint's not broken. Somebody didn't give you the appropriate permissions, or more importantly, perhaps, you might not have given that user the appropriate permissions. In order to effectively administrate permissions in a SharePoint environment, there are two different components that you'll need to be aware of in order to do just that. The first are groups. You need groups to organize people. Now groups are just that, they're groups of people organized under one common name. If I was gonna say you were part of the Sean group, that doesn't necessarily mean anything except that when I say, hey Sean group, everybody who's a part of that group looks up. The second component you'll need to be aware of are levels. Levels are the key for the lock. They are what define what you can and cannot do. A standard SharePoint implementation has 33 different permissions. Out of those 33, each permission level is some combination of yeses and nos that defines what a user can do. So you need both groups to organize people and levels to define what those people can do in order to truly effectively administrate permissions. So let's illustrate this point. There are a couple of default groups that you will start out with in SharePoint. The owners group, the members group, and the visitors group. These are three default groups that exist in all implementations of SharePoint. That said, your organization can customize these groups, so they might not necessarily have the same names, but the concept will still apply. And on the other side, with levels, there's the full control level, the contribute level, and the read level. Now these are just three of the many levels that are provided out of the box. Most of those levels aren't assigned to any one particular group out of the box, but they are available to us. And when we talk about assigning permission levels later, you'll get to see when we might choose to use them. In this instance, you can actually pretty easily decipher which group starts with what level. The owners group is being assigned to the full control level by default, meaning that anyone in the owners group has full control. Likewise, the members group by default is assigned the contribute level permission, meaning that everybody in the members group has the contribute level permissions, the ability to upload files, edit existing files, and even delete existing files. And visitors are often given the read level permission, giving users the ability to look at content, but not touch. Now it's important to note that just because you're in a group called owners doesn't necessarily mean that you have full control. Remember, the name of the group doesn't matter. And likewise, who's in the group doesn't matter when it comes to defining what you can or can't do. For example, I could easily assign the owners group the read level permission and the visitors group the full control level permission. It's the levels themselves that define what users can and can't do, not the groups they're in. So if I assign the visitors group the full control level, all these people in the visitors group will have total control over that particular site. So it's important to understand that we need both of these in order to effectively administrate. So I get a lot of questions. And one of the most common questions is why do groups exist? So let's say for the sake of argument here, I've got Sean, Raj, and Jessica. I could easily, instead of putting them into a group, assign them individually the read level permissions. So could I do that? Could I assign individual permission levels on a person by person basis? Yeah, absolutely. In spite of the fact that we just talked about groups and levels, it's important to note you can assign permission levels directly to people, but why wouldn't you? What could there possibly be that would make it a bad idea, or not a bad idea, but not a great idea to assign permissions on a person by person basis? Well, let's say for the sake of argument, Sean, Jessica, and Raj all have the read level permission, which enables them the ability to view lists and libraries and download their own copies of files that they have the ability to view. Well, I might not necessarily want them to be able to download content. So that means that I have to change the permission level that's assigned to them. Well, now that means one by one, removing each individual 
person's permissions. So instead of editing one big group that had all of these individuals in it, I have to, one by one, say you don't have read anymore, you don't have read anymore, and you don't have read anymore. And once I've removed them three separate times, I have to, once again, three separate times, add the view level permission, which allows users to view content, but not download it. So did that sound tedious? To have to manage individuals on a one by one by one basis? That was three people. How many people work in your department or on your team or in this project? That's a really tedious way of managing content. To say nothing of the fact that as new people are added, we'll have to add them individually and assign them their own permission levels as well. And once again, as we update them, we'll need to do it on a one by one by one basis. Or we could put them into a group called the visitor group in this example. Although of course the group name doesn't matter. It's just that there's a group and assign that group the read level permissions. So now, having assigned that permission level one time, everybody in that group gets that permission. And if we decide after the fact, actually, we don't want people in the visitors group to have read level permissions, we can remove it and assign the view level permission one time, and thereby change everybody's permission within the group. It's that much more simple. So when it comes to managing permissions on an individual versus a group scale, it is always a better idea to assign them to a group instead of to a person. Even if you can only think of one person that would need that permission level, still make a group. Why? Because even though you may not need more than one person to have that permission level now, you're built to scale. Meaning that eventually, if someone does need that permission, it's a whole lot easier now to drop them into that group and have them get that existent permission level than it is to add that person on an individual level to the view level permission. So this is the fundamental concept when it comes to managing permissions in SharePoint. Groups, not individuals. Now that we've spent a little bit of time talking about permission groups, permission levels, and how we can effectively administrate the two, it's time to talk a little bit about actually creating some of that structure. So we're gonna start off by talking about creating permission groups. If you'll remember, groups are just a collection of people underneath a common name. So to manage groups and create groups, you've gotta know where to go. So we're going to need to be able to manage our site permissions. If you'll remember, clicking on the gear in the top right corner allowed us to get into site contents, which contained all of our data and structure. Of course, when we're managing permissions, we're not actually managing the physical data and structure. We're managing features regarding it. Specifically, we're talking about the security of that data and structure. So we're actually gonna go into site settings, which allows us to manage the features and options of this specific site we're currently in. It's important to note that both with site contents and site settings, we're talking about specifically this site. So even though there may be sites beneath or above this site, the site contents and site settings we're seeing is specific to this particular site. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump into site settings. Having jumped into site settings, of course, remember, if you can see it, you can do it. In this case here, I'm looking for site permissions. Now, don't let this fool you. You might think, oh, well, I'm gonna create a group, so I'm going to need to go into people and groups. That's not the case, because when you're creating a group, you're still doing it in the interest of managing your site's permissions. So we're gonna go to site permissions and start from there. Go ahead and pause the video and get to this point. Remember, we clicked on the gear and went to site settings. And from there, we selected site permissions. Welcome back. So now that we've finally gotten into site permissions, let's take a look at where we're at. On the left-hand side, I see a couple of names, Excel services viewers, sandbox site members, sandbox site owners, sandbox site visitors. So what am I looking at here? Well, if you take a look at the type column here, I'm looking at SharePoint groups. Those are permissions groups, those same groups we talked about just a moment ago. Now, if you'll remember, groups don't actually mean much of anything. 
They simply unify a bunch of people under one common name. So there's a ton of people in the visitors group, a ton of people in the owners group, and a ton of people in the members group. But none of them are any better than the other until you take permission levels into account. Remember, because groups don't mean much of anything, you need permission levels to define what those users can actually do in this particular site. So for example, the sandbox site visitors have read access. The sandbox site owners have full control. And the sandbox site members have edit permissions. So in each of these different levels, we're seeing that whoever happens to be in the owners group has full control. It has nothing to do with the fact that the group's name says owners, it has everything to do with the fact that full control is assigned to that group. So it's pretty easy to decipher who has what kind of access, which means it's even easier to say, I wanna see everybody that has visitor access to this site and simply click on the name of that group and see all the individuals that currently have visitor access. In this case, you can see only one person currently has visitor access. Now that we've gotten a good general overview of what it is that we're actually looking at, let's turn our attention to the permissions tools that are up at the top portion of the screen here in the ribbon. To create a new group, find the Create Group button and give it a click. Now in the off chance that you don't have a Create Group button, there's a decent chance that you're not in the top level site. Keep in mind that if your site is inheriting permissions from the site above it, then there's a chance that you won't be able to create groups at that level. So you may need to go up a level or two. Now that I've clicked on create group, I'm gonna go ahead and give it a name. In this case here, I'm gonna go ahead and call this one, my site approvers. People who approve things. Down below in the site owner, this allows you to designate a dedicated person that will be in charge of that group. Now, of course, if you're a site owner or a site administrator or a site collection admin, you don't need to designate yourself, but you can if you'd like, and you can also designate somebody who may not normally have that permission to give them control of the group. In this case, I'll go ahead and leave myself. If you're not sure who to put, uh, feel free to put either yourself, your supervisor, uh, or a trusted coworker. With group settings, you get to decide who can view the membership of this group. Is it anybody who's in the group or is it everyone? And likewise, who can edit membership of the group? Is it just the group owner or is it anyone who's in the group? I gotta tell you, I generally don't recommend group members. Of course, your group will depend on what you choose, but that said, pointing the control and the hands of individuals who may not necessarily have a deep working knowledge of SharePoint uh, may not necessarily be the best idea. You do have the ability to allow requests. Simply say yes if you'd like to allow membership requests. Uh, again, I generally don't recommend that uh, simply because one, the process of finding the field where you would go to request it uh, is pretty roundabout. And two, if somebody's gonna need access, usually you'll have a pretty good idea of who that individual is so that you can add them into the appropriate group instead of them guessing what group they should go in. If you do choose to allow requests, you can also choose to auto accept requests, meaning that as soon as somebody requests, they're instantly accepted. There are very few circumstances where I can see that being a good idea. Uh, a great example of it being a good idea, however, could be uh, view access to a site. If somebody works for a company and they've just gotten hired and they request access to the group that has the view level permission, that might not necessarily be of consequence. So you might feel more comfortable auto accepting that. But that said, I generally advise against it. If you do choose to allow requests, you can designate where membership requests go, which email do they go to. And finally, give permission to the group for this site. So you'll see here, we've got a couple of checkboxes here, full control, design, edit, contribute, read, and view only. So in each of these, 
we're seeing a customized template of yeses and nos out of those 33 permissions that we talked about earlier. So these are those permission levels. They define what users can and cannot do. So full control, for example, has 33 out of 33. Design a little less, edit a little less than that. And in each of these instances, you can actually see descriptions that tell you exactly what these permission levels allow the user to do. So for example, design is almost the entire full control permission level. The only thing design can't do is change permissions, giving the user the ability to manage content at every level except the site and control structure and data. So design is essentially saying, hey, if somebody's gonna build the site, they're gonna need to be able to go backwards and forwards, up and down without permission uh, getting in their way. So we can give them the design level permission. Edit versus contribute is perhaps the number one question. Because if you're trying to figure out which permission level to give to somebody, you might say, oh, well, I'll give them edit if I want them to be able to edit files. But there is a big distinction between edit and contribute. Edit can add, edit, and delete lists and libraries, meaning they can create entirely new libraries and entirely new lists. And likewise, they can delete entire libraries and delete entire lists, in addition to being able to edit files. So edit does give a lot of control to individuals, uh, and I caution you against that one if all you're trying to do is give an individual the ability to upload files and edit existing files. Now in this case here, I called mine the site approvers. There's only two permission levels that we currently have here that have the approval permission, full control and design. So in order to have somebody that can approve pending content within content approval, I would have to either give them total control of the entire site or give them almost total control of the site's entire structure. Not a lot of room for wiggling, is there? So none of these permission levels quite meet the need just yet. At a minimum, however, I do know that whoever it is that is going to be in the site approvers is going to need to be able to contribute content in addition to their approval duties. So for now, I'm gonna go ahead and choose contribute and click create. Actually, I'm not gonna choose any permission level and click create. So I'm gonna leave all these blank for the time being. We'll come back to contribute in just a moment. But for now, I'm gonna go ahead and create my sandbox site approvers. I've defined my group owners. I haven't changed any of the group settings or membership requests from their defaults. I did not assign a permission level and I'm gonna click create. When you click create, you'll notice that you already have a member. You, you're your own best customer. So there are already at least one member in your group. Now, of course, it is here that you can go and add new people to this group. And we'll talk about adding people to groups in just a moment. But for now, go ahead and pause the video and catch up to this point. Remember, we went to site settings, site permissions, we selected create group and filled out the appropriate information but did not define a permission level. Go ahead and create that group, make sure to remember the name and join me back here in site permissions. So congratulations, you've created your first permissions group. At this stage here, you should be back in site permissions. If you'll remember, that was by clicking on the gear, going to site settings and selecting site permissions. Now take a look at the groups that are currently available here. I see visitors, I see owners, I see members. I don't see my sandbox site approvers. So what happened? I created that group. Well, it's important to note that when you create a permissions group but don't assign a permission level, that means it's not actually assigned to this particular site. Instead, it's floating around in the ether up here, waiting to be assigned. So there are actually a ton of groups available currently that we can't see because they have no meaning in this particular site. Remember, a group without a permission level 
means nothing. So why would we even see it? To assign a permission group, a permission level, to a specific site, find the Grant Permissions button here in the top left corner and give it a click. Having selected Grant Permissions, you'll see a little box that says Invite People. Now, of course, it says enter names or email addresses. So with the invite people and enter names and email addresses, you might fall under the ruse that this is where you will type people's names. Now, you can type people's names. But that said, if you type people's names here, you're assigning permission levels on an individual basis, which, if you recall our previous conversation about assigning permissions to groups versus people, that's not what we're trying to do here. So instead, it's in this box that I'm going to go ahead and type the name of the site approvers group. So I'm going to go ahead and type sandbox site. Yep, and sure enough, there's the sandbox site approvers. Of course, if I scroll down, you'll see all the sandbox site groups. But in this case, I want the sandbox site approvers. Now I can go ahead and include a personal message, meaning that everybody who's in that group will receive an email. But I don't want to click share just yet. This is the most common mistake people make, is they click grant permissions, they find the name of the group, they get super excited, and they don't ever stop to think, what permissions am I granting? Well, that's a great question. In order to see that, you have to click show options down at the very bottom. And it's here that you'll get to decide what permission level is assigned to this group. By clicking on the drop down, you'll see a couple of different things. Uh, you're going to see the names of groups that already exist and what permission levels they have assigned. You do not want to choose any of the permission groups. Those already exist. Instead, what we want to do is find a permission level down below that is not a group name and not bracketed. So I'm going to go ahead and find contribute and click share. So I've now granted permission to the site approvers group, and I've given them the contribute permission level. In order to see that, I'll need to refresh the page. There it is. There's my sandbox site approvers, and it's got the contribute level permission. Go ahead and pause the video and get this far. Click grant permissions. Search for that group you just created and define the contribute permission level. Once you've granted permission to a group or a person and you've defined a permission level, it's important to note you can always retroactively change what permissions are assigned to them. Remember, that was kind of the whole point of assigning those permission levels to groups, was that it was very easy to, in one motion, edit the permissions of all the individuals in a group. So let's say for the sake of argument here, Sandbox Site Members has the edit permission level. Well, we now know that the edit permission level enables users to create and destroy lists and libraries, which is a lot of power to give somebody who may not know about SharePoint, or at least not a lot about it. So I'm going to edit that permission. To edit the user permissions for a group, select the check mark on the left-hand side. Now, don't let this fool you. This little white box on the left-hand side next to the group name is not a checkbox. So you're going to want the actual checkbox just off to the left-hand side. And we're going to select Edit User Permissions. Having selected Edit User Permissions, I'm going to go ahead and uncheck Edit and then select Contribute and click OK. So I've now definitively edited the permission level associated with the Sandbox site members. Now, everybody that's in the members group has the contribute permission level. I've changed everybody in one motion. Go ahead and give that a shot. Remember, select the check mark on the left-hand side, edit user permissions, uncheck the permission levels you don't want, select the ones you do. Welcome back. So now that we've assigned the Sandbox Site Approvers group the Contribute Level permission, everything's good, right? Not quite. Remember, 
we assign them the contribute level permission because while we do want them to be able to do regular stuff within SharePoint, we also want them to be able to approve content. Unfortunately, right now, there's only two permission levels that allow users to approve content, design and full control, both of which grant innumerable privileges to that user, uh, which I may not necessarily want to give. I may trust them to know policy and procedure and know what to approve and what not to approve, but I may not necessarily feel comfortable giving them total access to the site, the ability to manage permissions, for example. That's a lot. So if none of those other permission levels meet the need, what I can do is I can create my own. So here at the top level site, it is critical to keep in mind that most of your actions here at the site permissions level, in order to have the maximum impact, those changes take place at the top level site, meaning there is no site above me. Now you can do some of this at lower levels, but when it comes to things like creating new permission levels, you have to have permission at the top, top level site. Now, if you don't see permissions levels here, you'll probably see a button here on the left-hand side that says Manage Parent. So feel free to give that a click as many times as necessary until you see permissions levels here at the top. And I'll go ahead and give that a click. So here we go. Here are all of our permission levels. You'll see here, SharePoint won't let you delete the default ones that are being provided here. Those are necessary. But that said, what you can do is add new permission levels as you need them. So we're gonna do just that. We're gonna add a new permission level. So just to recap here, we got into this environment by being at the top level site and selecting permission levels. Here in permission levels, I'm gonna go ahead and click add a permission level. Now remember, if you can't see add a permission level, guess what? You don't have permission to add a permission level. Remember, if you can see it, you can do it. Go ahead and pause the video and get to this point. Remember, we went into the gear, site settings, site permissions. Then we selected permission levels and selected add a permission level, which got us here. Welcome back. So we're now in the add a permission level view. So I'm gonna go ahead and call this the approval permission, meaning that whatever user gets this permission, they're gonna be granted the approval permission. There we go. Now, as I scroll down here, this is where we get into permissions. So here are all 33 permissions that we've talked about here. So each one of these grants the user some level of permission as to what they are allowed to do. That said, all I want to do is create a permission level that adds on this one action, approve items. Now you'll notice when I select approve items, a few other options get checked, like view and edit. Of course, if you uncheck any of those, you lose out on approved items, so you have to leave those selected. But all we want in this particular permissions level is the approved items. Now you'll see that there's quite a few different permissions variants here. Site permissions, for example, the ability to manage permissions at all, create groups, apply themes. In this case here, I'm gonna go ahead and scroll all the way down and click create. So all I've done is I've named it and I've chosen the one extra permission level I want to add on to an existing user. And I'm gonna click create. Now you can edit your permissions levels at any time by simply clicking on the name of the permission level. It'll allow you to go back in and make changes as needed. Go ahead and pause the video and get to this point. Name your permission level and select the approval permission and click create. Now there's a reason we chose only that one permission out of all of those permissions in approval. 
Because keep in mind, if I give somebody just the approval permission, they're going to be incredibly limited in what they can and cannot do. But I didn't create the approval permission level to replace any of these. Instead, I designed the approval level permission to complement any of these other permission levels. So you can actually combine permission levels to meet specific needs. So let's say for the sake of argument here, I have somebody who currently has edit access. And that's great. I still don't want to give them design, which would allow them to manage permissions, but I still want them to be able to add and delete lists and libraries. But I also now need them to be able to approve content. And likewise, I might have users that have the ability to read and edit files. I don't want them to be able to add and remove libraries and lists, but I need them to approve content. In both of these scenarios now, I can actually add on the approval level permission. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go back to site settings. We're going to go back to site permissions. We're going to select sandbox site approvers and we're going to edit the user permissions. Keep in mind that the sandbox site approvers already has the contribute level permission, which is exactly what the members have. This wouldn't make any sense if this was our goal. Just as a quick side note, there are very few reasons to have multiple groups with the same permission levels, unless you're using that explicitly to control retention and how long somebody should have access to something. It doesn't make much, if any, sense to have multiple groups with the same permission level. So I'm going to go ahead and select Sandbox Site Approvers and Edit User Permissions. And sure enough, there's the approval level permission. Notice that when I select it, Contribute stays selected. I'm combining them. I'm saying I want that user to have all the authority of a contribute level permission with the added authority of approval. When you combine permission levels, it's all about the yes. What do I mean by that? You might remember in an earlier video, I referenced that permissioning is a lot like parenting. If a kid asks mom for a cookie and mom says no, and then the kid goes to dad and asks for a cookie and dad says yes, guess what? The kid's going to get a cookie. So that's how permission levels work. When you take multiple permission levels and you mush them together, it combines the yeses from both permission levels. So the yes is dominant. So when contribute says yes, you can add and update and view and delete. And view says you can only view. Guess what? Wherever contribute says yes, where view says no, the answer is yes. And likewise, while contribute does not say yes to approval, approval does. And so when you combine the two, you get a contributor who can also approve content. And there you go. Go ahead and pause the video and join me here. Edit an existing user group and assign a secondary permission level to that group. To add new users to groups, simply select the name of the group. From here, go ahead and click New. Remember, if you don't see New, that means that you don't have the ability to add new users to that group. So I'll go ahead and click New, and you'll get a box that looks like this, Invite People, where I can enter names, email addresses, or everyone. By clicking in the box here, I can type the names of any one individual here within the organization, like my good friend LT05, or Sean. You can also search active directory groups. So if, for example, you have a human resources group, or if you have a finance group, or a project management group. So you can search those two if they exist in the active directory. You cannot use distribution lists. So if you have any personal groups that exist on your computer, distribution lists are not searchable groups, but they can be used if they exist in the Active Directory. 
So once you find the individuals you'd like to add, remember, you're already adding them into a group. So you're defining their permission level by just putting them into the group. So when you click on show options, you're not going to see that same drop down that we saw earlier. But I do get to decide whether or not I want to send an email. Maybe I want to grant permission, but not tell them about it because they don't need it right now. But when they do, they'll ask me for it. and It would be better for them to have it now than for me to have to worry about it later. So let's say I don't want to flood their inbox. I'll turn off send an email and I'll click share. To remove an individual from a group, select the check mark on the left hand side, go to actions and select remove users from group and click OK. At any point, you can manage the settings for this particular group by clicking on settings and selecting group settings. Now you might see the option make default group, meaning that anytime somebody clicks share and shares this particular site with somebody, this will be the group that it defaults to. In this case, this probably isn't the best site to default to. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and jump back into my site permissions here. Which group do you think should be the default? Should the default be to give them contribute access? Should the default be to give them full control? I'm of the mind that the default for me is going to be visitor access, meaning they can see stuff, but they can't actually touch it. And I can fix that later if I need to. So I'll jump into Sandbox Site Visitors. Remember, if I want to add new people, simply click New. But in this case, I'll go ahead and click Settings and select Make Default Group. And click OK. And just like that, this is now the default group. So anybody that shares this site or anybody that requests access to the site, it defaults to visitors. And I can customize that while I'm granting permission if I need to. But if I'm not the one doing it and someone else is either superseding my authority or they don't know what they're doing, at a minimum, they're only getting read access. So go ahead and pause the video. Try a couple of these out for yourself. Remember. We tried a few different things here. We added a user to a group. So go ahead and add a user to a group. Then try removing that same user from the group. And finally, set the default group as one of these groups here based on what permission level you think is appropriate for somebody, even if you're not the one assigning it. What would you feel more comfortable as the default? It's important to note when working in SharePoint that permissions exist at every single level. We've been talking about, for the duration of this, managing permissions at the top level site. Now by default, the top level site is the arbiter of what sites below it can and cannot do. So all these team sites below the top level site, by default, are looking up and saying, who are your owners? Who are your members? Who has full control? Who has visitor access? and they're just going along with it. And likewise, any sites below them are also looking up. So if these sites are looking up, then that means that these sites are looking up. So by default, the top level site is defining what everything else below is doing. Now that said, permissions also exist at the list and library level. So where do you think they're looking? to inherit their permissions? Well, they're looking at their parent site. So if their parent site is looking at the top level site, then the library's permissions are being defined by the top level site. But we don't have to work that way. We do have the ability to what we call break inheritance, which is to say no longer look up and say, I'll set my own rules from here and down. So if I break inheritance, if I say I no longer want to inherit the permissions from the top level site, and instead I want to be my own thing, well, if I define my permission levels here, I'm now impacting all the lists and libraries inside this site, as well as any subsites that are directly beneath this site. So keep in mind that if I've only broken inheritance here, 
then team site two and team site three in this example are still looking up. Breaking inheritance isn't saying remove me from the tree. It's simply saying, I don't want to look up. Your owners may not be my owners and we'll need to set that aside. So let's talk about breaking inheritance. To break inheritance, we're going to need something to break the inheritance of. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to jump into the document library we've been spending quite a bit of time in, Project Proposals. In this case here, remember, you can get into any list or library by going to Site Contents and selecting it from there. If you do go through Site Contents, remember, you can simply drop in, find the library, and give it a click. Now I'm using the example of a library, but I want to be clear that the process of breaking inheritance has nothing to do with specific list or library actions. To manage the permissions of a list or a library, much in the same way that we went to site settings to manage the permissions of a site, to manage the list or library settings, we need to go to list or library settings. Managing site permissions, Insight settings, managing list and library permissions, list and library settings. Making the sense? So now I'm gonna go ahead and click on the gear in the top right and select library settings. Although I'll remind you, you can go to site contents as well. Find the list or library you're working with, click the ellipses to the right and select settings from there. So here I am in the library settings. If you'll take a look, you'll notice there are actually three columns of settings available here. There's general settings, permissions and management, and communications. Hmm, I wonder which one's gonna contain permission stuff. Doesn't look like general settings is gonna do it. Doesn't look like communications is gonna do it. Hey, if only there was some conveniently named link that would allow me to manage permissions for this document library. Wouldn't that be nice if there was some easily named, relatively easy to understand, or guess even, link that would say permissions to manage this document library. Oh yeah, there it is. So here inside list and library settings, it's gonna be in relatively the same place. Now, a quick reminder, if you can't see this link, there's a good chance that that means you don't have the ability to manage permissions of apps. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on permissions for this document library. Go ahead and pause the video and get to this point. Remember, we went into site contents. We found the list or library we wanted to manage the permissions of, and we clicked on the ellipses and went to settings. We are in the list or library settings of any list or library that you would like to manage the permissions of. From there, we selected permissions for this document library or permissions for this list. Go ahead and get here, and we'll see you after the break. Welcome back. So you might notice that this interface looks really familiar if you just came from the site permissions videos. The site permissions interface and the list and library permissions interface are nearly identical. In fact, there's not a lot indicating that you're even managing permissions of this library, except for the giant yellow bar that says this library inherits permissions from its parent. So in this case, we're seeing two different things. We're seeing one, we're managing the permissions of a library, not a site. Two, we're seeing that currently, this library is inheriting its permissions from above. In this case, the site that it's currently within. When you create a list or a library, by default, it inherits the permissions of the site you build it in, which makes sense. What we would like to do is say no more. We no longer want just anybody to be able to get into this particular site. Instead, we want this to be a library specific to site owners and no one else. So that would mean getting rid of all these other groups. The problem is right now, I'm not seeing any checkboxes on the left-hand side letting me manage this, and rightfully so. If I tried to delete these groups right now, I would be deleting them out of the site and would thereby kick them out of the entire SharePoint environment which could be a problem. So what I need to do before I can go any further 
is I need to stop inheriting permissions. Now, you have got to be absolutely clear on where you currently are. You need some reference that you are currently inside of a library, and you certainly need to make sure you know which library you're in. Because if, when you choose to stop inheriting permissions, not initially, but as time goes on, you can do some pretty serious damage to the permissions structure of a SharePoint site if you don't know where you are. Remember, the most important thing in real estate is the same most important thing in SharePoint, location. Where you are matters. Now, if you were not trying to manage the permissions of this library, for example, maybe you were trying to create a group or maybe you were trying to create a permissions level. Remember, you're not gonna see those options here because you're not at the top level site. To get to the top level site, you could click manage parent, which would take you to the site settings and site permissions of, in this case, Project Central, our top level site. But I don't wanna go there. I wanna manage this library. I'm going to stop inheriting permissions. It says you are about to create unique permissions for this document library. Changes made to the parent site permissions will no longer affect this document library. I'll go ahead and click OK. And just like that, this library is no longer looking up. Go ahead and pause the video and break inheritance. So congratulations. This library now has unique permissions. Now, there are some really important things to keep in mind that we're gonna talk about now. One of the first ones is you actually haven't kicked anybody out yet. When you break inheritance, you're not saying kick everybody out and start over. You're simply saying that I no longer want to receive new information from the parent site. But the groups that were already given access continue to have access, and rightfully so. If you broke inheritance and it deleted all these groups, it would take you with it. The only reason you have any control at all is because one of these groups is in here giving you full control. So the second motion of breaking inheritance should be identifying which groups you do and do not want to have access. So in my instance, I don't need anybody that isn't an owner. So I'm gonna select all the groups that are not the site owners. Now, I wanna be clear on this. Be very, very sure you are not deleting the group that you are in. SharePoint will not warn you if you remove the group that you are in. And if you do delete the group that you're in, that removes the permission level that you were being given and you will not be able to continue managing permissions. You will have effectively locked yourself out. And believe me when I say there is no more embarrassing phone call than I locked myself out of my own site. So be very careful about what groups you are deleting. If you're really concerned that you don't know which group is what, feel free to break the rules, grant permissions, and add yourself individually and give yourself full control. Just temporarily, just to make sure you don't remove yourself. So in this case here, I went ahead and added myself as an individual and granted myself full control. So now, even if I did select all of them except me and click remove user permissions, I'll still be in full control meaning I can fix it. In this case, I'm gonna keep my site owners and I'm going to remove user permissions. Removing user permissions does not delete the group. Instead, what it does is it removes the permission level that's being assigned. Meaning that while the group will continue to exist, of course it has to, those are the same groups used at the site level. If I deleted them, the site wouldn't have any groups. So I'm simply saying those permission levels are not assigned to those groups in this particular library. And I'm gonna click okay. So there you go. I've now removed all groups except for the owners group. In this case, because I can still see the site, I can now comfortably make sure that I'm in the owners group once again and remove myself as an individual.
and I should be good to go. Once again, please, for the love of everything, be very clear that you are in the site group that assigns full control or whatever permission level is currently granting you permissions rights. So now this library is a maverick. It's off doing its own thing. It's no longer looking up. People that are in the members group, the visitors group, the approvers group, not only can they not access this library, they can't even see it. Even if they were to go into site contents right now and scroll down, where I can currently see project proposals, take a look at this site that I have here, logged in as a completely separate user, LT04. No project proposals library. It simply doesn't exist. Pretty cool. So remember, if you can see it, you can do it. And if you can't, that means you're missing permissions. So go ahead and pause the video and catch up. We've broken inheritance. We removed all groups except for our own, making sure we did not remove the group that gives us permission. Go ahead and pause the video and join us after the break. Breaking permissions has a ton of real world use cases, whether it's making sure that owners at the top level site are not owners of every other site, or likewise, making sure that I can create subsites down below my site and give people total control without giving them total control of my site. But that said, breaking inheritance, while powerful, does have its downsides. So it's important to note that we need to know how to undo that breaking of inheritance, which is to say, re-inherit permissions. To re-inherit the permissions of any list or library, first, get into the list and library settings. We broke the inheritance of project proposals. Keep in mind that none of these other lists and libraries have broken inheritance. They're all still looking up. Remember, when you're managing the permissions of an individual list or library, it's just that, an individual list and library. So I'm gonna select project proposals and get into its settings. From here, where am I gonna go to manage permissions for this document library? There it is. Sure enough, there's that big yellow bar telling me this library has unique permissions. But I no longer want it to have unique permissions. Instead, I would like to delete those unique permissions meaning I would like to re-inherit my parent site's permissions. So I'm gonna go ahead and give delete unique permissions a click and click okay. And just like that, I have now re-inherited permissions, meaning that all those groups that I removed earlier are now back because that's what the parent site says. This library now re-inherits its permissions. So go ahead and pause the video and re-inherit permissions from that list or library that you broke inheritance in. Module seven, creating and managing sites. In this module, we'll talk about creating standard sites and subsites. We'll discuss customizing the look and feel of your sites. And finally, We'll talk about saving sites as templates, what you'll need to know, and how it can make your job a lot easier. Let's go ahead and get started. Operating in a single site has its perks. It's a lot easier to streamline permissions. It's a lot easier to keep everybody in one single place. And it's a lot easier to put all your resources into making this one site work really well. The reality is that that's not always going to be how things work. There are plenty of examples where we'll need to break users out into their own respective environments, whether it's so that we can give individuals the appropriate level of permission without impacting this site, or because the subject matter is so completely separate from what we're talking about on this particular site that it necessitates a separation of content. And so it's with that that we begin the conversation on creating subsites. Now, subsites are no different than the sites we're currently in now. It simply means a site below a site. So it has access to all the same content features and structure 
that are available here at the top level site. The only difference is location. To see and consequently create new subsites, we need to know where to go to create content and structure and to manage content and structure. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, boy, that sounds a whole lot like site contents, you're absolutely right. Go ahead and find site contents in the gear dropdown and give it a click. Now, we've spent a lot of time in site contents, but we haven't really dove in to the second portion here. You'll notice that underneath, of course, contents is where all of our lists and libraries are. But if you click on subsites, you can actually see any subsites that are below this particular site. And you'll notice I have four. I have Project Red, Project Green, Project Blue, and a new site that I've already created as well. Now, of course, sites have their own ellipses with their own site contents, so I can get right into their data quickly. Now, do keep in mind, site contents is only showing me this site's contents. So I'm not seeing anything from these sites except that these sites exist. To create a new subsite, click the new dropdown here in site contents. Of course, we've already been here to create a new list, a new page, a new library, a new app. But you might not have noticed, this is also where we'll go to create a new subsite. Remember, if you don't see subsite in the dropdown, that's an issue of permissioning. So I went ahead and clicked on new subsite. We'll go ahead and give it a title and description. In this case, we'll say this is Project Tea Leaf. Now, unlike lists and libraries, website URLs can always be changed. We don't always recommend it, but it can be done. So in this case, what I'm going to go ahead and do is just call this tea leaf to start. Of course, if I need to change the site name because the project name has changed, I can do that. Here in the template selection, there are a couple of different options we have at our disposal. The most common style of SharePoint site is the team site. The team site contains most of the functionality that we've talked about, all of the functionality that we've talked about in these videos. All other styles of collaboration templates are a bit more focused. For more information on all these templates, simply give them a click and you can read the description down below to give some context as to what they're about. You'll also notice, of course, we have the enterprise style templates. These all have very specific focuses that are outside the scope of what we generally consider SharePoint to be when we think about end user usage, real-time collaboration, document sharing. While these do have some pretty incredible capabilities, they're a little outside the scope of what we'll talk about here in these videos. So in this case, we're gonna choose the team site collaboration template. Once you've chosen the template, the permissions question is critical. Are we going to inherit the permissions of the parent site? Meaning, are we gonna look up? Or are we going to define our own unique permissions? Remember, even if you choose to inherit permissions now, you can always break it later. And likewise, even if you choose to use unique permissions now, you can always choose to re-inherit later. In this example, we'll go ahead and use the same permissions as the parent site. So that site's owners will be my site's owners as well. Navigation. Display this site on the quick launch of the parent site. Meaning, do we want this site to be on that left navigation bar? The default is no, and I'm not gonna change that. We'll talk about navigation in the next couple of videos. The next option is, do you wanna display the site on the top link bar of the parent site? Meaning, up here. The default answer is yes and we're gonna leave it at yes. And finally, do we want to inherit the top links bar from the parent site? The default is no, meaning that how this looks right now, I do not want to inherit that. 
that's the default, I'm going to deviate. I'm going to say yes, meaning that I do want the same top level bar. And finally, I'm going to click create. So just to recap, we've named the site. We assigned a URL. Remember to follow the naming conventions here in the website address. You can use camel casing, no spaces, and certainly no special characters. We've chosen the team site template. Again, that is the standard SharePoint template. It's the default for every SharePoint implementation. We've decided to look up and inherit permissions from the parent site. We decided we didn't want to show the site on the quick launch, the left navigation pane, but that we did want to show it on the top links bar. And finally, that we wanted to bring the top links bar with us from the parent site. I'm going to go ahead and click create. While this is working on it, go ahead and pause the video and catch up to us at this point. We'll see you after the break. So welcome to your brand new site. You'll notice that there's a lot of things that look pretty different compared to the site we've been operating in. Right out of the gate, you'll see your getting started links. These are your helper links to help you build out your site. Now, you actually don't need these because believe it or not, you know how to do most of this by now. So we're gonna go ahead and click remove this. Keep in mind that when you do remove it and confirm, you can always find it again here in the gear underneath getting started. So you might have noticed that the look and feel of this site looks a little different. Whereas in Project Central, I had this kind of LA Noir dark gray theme. In Project Tea Leaf, you can see it's defaulted to this bright white and blue interface. This is the classic office theme. That said, with a standard SharePoint implementation, you can customize the look and feel based on your specific needs. To customize the look and feel, click on the gear in the top right corner and go to Site Settings. You can also click on Change the Look, but we'll show you how to go through both ways. Here in Site Settings, you'll notice that we have an entire section called Look and Feel, where you can customize the title of the site, the description, and even the logo. Keep in mind, if you are going to customize the logo, it's relatively easy to do so. You can simply upload from your computer or select the logo straight from SharePoint. It's also here that you can rename the title if you need to. It's also here that you can customize the web address. So as promised, you can always change the name and URL of the site after the fact if you need to. In fact, it really only is lists and libraries that you cannot change the URLs of. So beyond title, description, and logo, you'll have options to manage your quick launch and top links bar, as well as the broad navigational elements as a collective whole. We'll talk about all three of these in later videos. For now, let's turn our attention to change the look, the same link that we saw in the gear dropdown. Now again, if you don't see change the look, either here in the dropdown or in site settings, that's an issue of permissions. You may not have the authority to change the look and feel of your site, depending on your organization's policies. Having selected change the look, you're going to get a template preview of all the different pre-built templates that are available here in SharePoint. Go ahead and pause the video and get to this point. Remember, we clicked on the gear and selected change the look or site settings, and then underneath the look and feel section, change the look. Now that we're in this template gallery or design gallery, what we'd like to do is pick a template that meets our needs. You'll see that there's a variety of different options and don't let this scare you. The color palettes are customizable. So if you look at one that is close to what you want, but you're not in love with the color scheme, give it a click anyways and check it out. In this example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and choose the office theme. Now the office theme is the one that's already been selected. You'll notice that it's got that customary all white background and a blue bar at the top. You can customize the background by either dragging and dropping an image there or selecting change. Down below, 
you can change the color palette. You've got a lot of options at your disposal. So if you're more of a, a pink or a brown and blue, you've got a lot of flexibility here. Maybe you like a little bit of red. So I'll go ahead and give that a click. And you'll see, all right, that's looking pretty good. Site layout, there are two site layouts at your disposal, Seattle and Oslo. Both named in homage to, of course, Microsoft's home state of Washington. Now, Seattle is the custom style that we've seen before. We've got the navigation bar on the left-hand side. We've got a navigation link section at the top. Oslo, on the other hand, puts that all up here. So the quick launch is actually found up at the top portion of the screen as opposed to on the left. So if you're complaining about the fact that you've lost a lot of space using this quick launch bar on the left-hand side, you can get it back utilizing the Oslo site layout. Now, heed this warning, whatever you choose, be consistent. If you're a site owner of all the sites from the top down, for the love of everything, be consistent. Because if you choose the Seattle layout in one and the Oslo site layout in another and Seattle and then Oslo, you're inducing a lot of confusion. Because if there's not a reason for your choice except it's a cool look or I felt like it or it's Wednesday, that's not going to fly. And the same applies to your color scheme. Be consistent or give that color scheme a meaning. Because if you don't, if you just pick things arbitrarily, users are going to be incredibly confused from site to site. What they might have known to be true in one site may not necessarily be true in another. So if I decide on one site I'm going to do white and red, but on another site I'm going to do black and pink, when users go into this site, they're going to think they're in a whole other world. So be very, very careful about how you choose your color schemes. Be very, very careful about how you choose your site layout. Give it some consideration, and above all else, be consistent. Of course, you can also choose your fonts. Microsoft does provide Sego UI Lite uh, as the header and Sego UI as the default body text. You can customize that if you're more of a uh, Times New Roman, for example. I believe they have that one. No, it looks like they plucked it out finally. Uh, of course, we've got classic century Gothic. Uh, so there is some flexibility here, but we'll go ahead and keep it as is. Once you've customized your layout the way you want it to be, whether it's the Oslo style or the color scheme, go ahead and click try it out. Try it out will allow you to see what this site would look like if you were to apply this theme. Now, this may happen from time to time. In this case, my preview hasn't reloaded. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and click the refresh icon here. And in fact, you should go ahead and do the same as well in case yours doesn't load. Go ahead and pause the video, and we'll see you after the break. Welcome back. So what we've done up until this point is we've gone as far as customizing the look and feel. We've chosen a different site layout. We've chosen a different color scheme. We might have even chosen different font styles. One cautionary tale with regards to the Oslo style, there's no top links bar. It utilizes the left navigation pane, the quick launch, instead of the top links at all. So there is no top links when you use the Oslo style. So be careful with that. If you're relying on that top links bar to allow users to be able to navigate, then that might be kind of important. If you're not in love with the look and feel of this particular site and you've decided that you'd like to customize it some more, click no, not quite there. But otherwise, if you like the way this looks and you're feeling pretty good, go ahead and select yes, keep it. This will assign that design to this site. And there it is. You'll notice even in the site settings, I have a lot more space on the left here. I'll go ahead and click home. And there you go. You can see that Oslo definitely gives you a lot more space to work with here on the left hand side. For those of you that rely on the quick launch, however, that may not necessarily be what you wanted. So feel free to always go back and change the look again if you need to go back to the Seattle style layout. You're not married to this. You can always customize it later. But again, be consistent. 
So go ahead and pause the video and try this again for yourself. Click on the gear and go to change the look. Choose a different template. Try a different site layout. See what you like. See what looks good. See what makes sense. Once you feel comfortable with changing the look and feel, go ahead and join us after the break. Welcome back. So I went ahead and made some customizations to the site. I've added a couple of web parts here and I added a little bit of context here in the top right. So I, I made a couple of pretty substantive changes to the site because what we're about to do is really cool, but it's important to know its limitations. Now, before we get into what it is that we're talking about, uh, take a look. I have went ahead and populated some data. I've built out a couple of pages. I've built out clearly uh, some lists and some libraries, but if I ever need another project site, how much more will it deviate from what I'm currently looking at right here? I'm probably gonna need a, a project files library. I'm probably gonna need a projects task list. There are lots of different things I might create and customize that I might not want to have to go and create and customize all over again. Now, we did talk about in earlier videos the ability to build out a custom list or library that had custom metadata that we could then use over and over and over again. We called it a template, a list or library template. We have that same capability, not just at a list and library scale, but at a site-wide scale. So we're gonna talk about how to do that now. To templatize, I'm not sure it's a word, but it is today, to templatize or turn into a template this particular site once you've got everything exactly where you want it, go to Site Settings. Now, here in Site Settings, what we're looking for is Site Actions. And boy, I gotta tell you, the way they name these links, it's pretty cut and dry where we're going here. We're gonna save this site as a template. Having selected Save Site as Template, the process is nearly identical when it comes to saving a site as it was for saving a list or a library. So the file name, we'll need to make sure that we're succinct, but we don't break any of the rules, we're trying to avoid spaces, special characters. We'll call this project site. The template name, however, will be company standard project site. Use this template to build all company project sites. Now, before we go any further, the most important part here, include content. Now, I made some pretty explicit changes in this site that aren't part of the standard implementation. I've changed the look and feel. I'm using a different site layout. I'm using Oslo instead of Seattle. I also have files uploaded. I custom built the home page. So I'm not going to choose to include content the first time and then I am going to include content the second time. So I'm gonna go ahead and click OK. Without data. Now, saving a site as a template does take time, so give it a moment. When it's done, however, you should get a pop-up much like the one we saw when we were templatizing a list or a library, which means it's gonna say, operation complete. Go ahead and pause the video and get to this point. Save your site as a template without content. We'll see you after the break. Once this has been saved successfully, go ahead and click OK. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna save this site one more time, this time including content. So I'm gonna go ahead and click the gear, jump to site settings, and I'm going to save site as template again. Once again, we're gonna go ahead and give it a good name. In this game, we'll call it Project Site with content. Template name will be company standard project site and content. This time we're gonna include content. It is incredibly important to remember that no matter whether you choose to include content or not, item security is not maintained, meaning that any custom permissioning that you may have built out does not stick. All permissioning is wiped out so that when you build the site, you can either choose to inherit permissions or to build out your own unique ones at that time. Additionally, if there's any custom workflows that are present, 
including the content will include those workflows, but not including content means that those workflows go out the window. So it is really important to keep in mind that including content may be to your benefit, but you're going to have to know the limitations. So finally, I'm gonna go ahead and click okay, and we'll let it load. Go ahead and pause the video, and one more time, go ahead and save this site as a template, this time, including content. We'll see you after the break. Welcome back. All right, uh, so we've now saved this site as a template twice. I'm gonna go ahead and click okay. To build a site from a template, the process is nearly identical to how we built out a site in the first place. Do you remember how we did that? We went to site contents. From here, we selected not subsites, that's where we go to see any subsites that we have. Instead, we're clicking new and then subsite. From here, title and description. Uh, this is a subsite underneath Project Tea Leaf, so uh, maybe in this case here, we'll call this one Operation Earl Grey. Go ahead and give it a good URL here. Now, when it comes to template selection, we've already talked about uh, the enterprise and, of course, to a certain degree, the Duet em enterprise. But what we didn't talk about is a tab that wasn't there before we had saved any custom templates, the custom tab. If you go into the custom tab, you'll actually see, hey, look, there are those two template sites that we just saved with data and without. So I'm gonna go ahead and build this site without data using that template, the company standard project without data. I'm gonna use the same permissions as the parent site. Remember, when you save a site as a template, it does not bring the permissions with it. And the same process as before. Do I want to display this site on the quick launch? Not necessarily. Do I want to use the top link bar from the parent site? Sure. And I'll click create. All right. So let's take a look at what did come with and what did not. Because there are some things that while you may have not necessarily thought they would come, they did. In particular, you'll notice of course that the project tasks list and project files have no data. Lists and libraries don't maintain their data with one key exception. Site pages maintain their data when you save a site as a template. So, you'll notice that the welcome message as well as the site pages structure stayed intact. Likewise, the site design stayed intact. The color scheme stayed intact. The only thing that changed is, of course, we're in a new URL now. We're within Project Tea Leaf in Project or Operation Earl Grey. So it's a pretty big distinction here. We keep the page, but any data that was inside the lists and libraries is gone. But that does mean that we can actually build out these hyper-custom lists and libraries and then simply clear them out so as to provide new users an empty shell to move into when a new project arises. Go ahead and pause the video and build a site based on your template that did not include content. And we'll see you after the break. Welcome back. So now let's go ahead and shift our attention back to building a site template with content. We've seen what it looks like without content. Page structure stayed intact, page data stayed intact, but standard lists and libraries did not have that data carried over. So let's go ahead and jump back into Project Tea Leaf here. And once again, we're gonna go ahead and jump into site contents. Of course, Subsites now has Operation Earl Grey, but we're not going to subsites to create the new site. We're going to new and subsite. We'll go ahead and call this one Operation Irish Breakfast. And this time for the template, we're going to select custom and company standard project site and content. 
This time that means we're going to include all data, including the data that was inside the lists and libraries. We're gonna use the same permissions as the parent site. Do we wanna use the top links bar? Sure, and we'll click create. Now it's important to note that when you're building a site or saving a site with content, it does take a little bit more time, but rest assured it is coming. So take a look. This time you'll see that of course the page structure is still intact, but the page structure was intact when we didn't include data as well. But what we do see that did stick as well is all the content that was in these lists and libraries as well. So two different ways to save a site as a template and use it. You could imagine, for example, that you could build out a site that includes content that provides files that explains to the user how to use a SharePoint site. And likewise, you could easily build out a couple of different pages, organize the navigation, and put things together in such a way that the user simply gets to jump in and add the data that's valuable and have a good looking site in seconds. So, to recap on everything we've talked about up until this point, when you're saving a site as a template, simply go to Site Settings, Save Site as Template. To use that site as a template, go to Site Contents, select New, and Subsite, and use the Custom Template tab when selecting your site template. As one final note, to delete a template, Go to Site Settings, but not Site Settings at this level. Instead, go to Site Settings at the top level site. So I'm actually going to need to go all the way back up to my original top level site. You see, templates, both list, library, and site templates, are stored at the top level site. Then go to Site Settings. Of course, list and library templates are hidden in the list templates view, but site templates are hidden in the solutions gallery. Super obvious, right? And it's here inside solutions that I can see all the projects that I have currently saved as templates. From there, I can select them, I can deactivate them, and once it's been deactivated, then, and only then, can you actually delete a site template. Go ahead and pause the video and try it. Try deleting one of your site templates. I will recommend deleting the one with content. We'll see you after the break. Our last note about templates is going to be downloading templates and sharing them with other SharePoint implementations. Sharing a template isn't as easy as moving a file from one library to another. In order to download a site template, you first need to get into the solutions section. So remember, we went into site settings of our top level site and went into solutions. To download a site template, you might notice there's no download button. All you have to do is click on the name of the template click and it'll offer to download it. So I'll go ahead and click save. And just like that, it's been downloaded. So let's say for the sake of argument here, I don't have that template. I'm gonna go ahead and deactivate it here. And then I'm gonna go ahead and delete it. To upload a site template that has been given to you by somebody else or that you've downloaded from another site collection, Go back to your site solutions gallery here and select upload solution. From here, go ahead and browse to find that site template. You'll know that all SharePoint site solutions end in .wsp. I'll go ahead and click open and okay. The most important thing to remember about uploading a site template is that you must, must, must activate it in order to use it. You cannot build a site based on a site template that has not been activated.
So I'm going to go ahead and click activate. And sure enough, there it is. And it is activated, meaning I can now put that template to work. Not bad. Go ahead and pause the video and try it for yourself. Download a site template, rename it, and re-upload. Make sure to activate it. And then if you're feeling particularly adventurous, build a site off of that site template you just uploaded. Module eight. In this module, we'll talk about site navigation and why it matters. We'll discuss customizing the current site's navigation. And finally, we'll talk about customizing global site navigation. Let's go ahead and get started. Let's talk site navigation. Site navigation is easily one of the most woefully underutilized parts of the SharePoint platform. Site navigation allows users to get from point A to point B across a litany of different subject matters, sites, lists, libraries, pages. How you build it matters. But in order to build it well, you have to know what tools are available to help us build it. So let's take a look. First things first, here on the left hand side, we're taking a look at our quick launch navigation. You'll hear it referred to as the quick launch quite a bit. Uh, so do keep that in mind, quick launch. At the top portion of the screen, we have our top links bar. So our top links bar and our quick launch are both customizable. You'll notice the edit links at the end of each of these. Now, of course, if you're using the Oslo style site layout, there is no top links bar. Instead, it's just the quick launch and the quick launch isn't on the left. It's up at the top where the top links are. So do keep that in mind that there's a reason we call it the quick launch, not the left navigation pane. It can move and it does occasionally move depending on site design. To make simple changes to the quick launch or the top links, simply click edit links. You'll notice the whole thing destabilizes, meaning that you can now click and drag to move around. And you can even click to remove. Not bad. Now, if you make a change that you don't want, let's say for the sake of argument, I'd accidentally remove everything. You can click cancel and it won't save any of the changes. Likewise with the top links bar, clicking on edit links allows us to move things around if we need to, but also I can remove them if I want to. And again, if you make changes you don't necessarily want, simply click cancel and you're good. Now you can also add links that are not part of SharePoint. So when I click on edit links on either one of these, you'll notice down at the bottom, there's a little plus link icon. And likewise in the top links bar, if I were to click on that, I get the plus link. Giving that a click allows me to add a link that doesn't already exist here in SharePoint. So I could say, uh, add a link, the universal help tool. And of course we all know that that's Google. Now, very, very important, when you are gonna add a link, remember to put the HTTP colon slash slash. If you type www.just, uh, that can cause some issues with rendering. Uh, so better safe than sorry, go ahead and add that HTTP at the beginning of your link and click okay. And sure enough, just as if it's always been there, there's the new universal help tool link. Simply click save. And as if Microsoft put it there themselves, there it is. Giving it a click, sure enough, loads up Google. Not bad. Go ahead and try customizing your quick launch or top links by adding a new link. We'll see after the break. Now there is a reason there are two different areas of navigation. It's because they can be utilized for separate purposes. So the quick launch is generally used for local navigation, meaning within this particular site. So we're in Project Central. So you would presume that everything we'll see here in the left navigation pane is in the Project Central site. If I click on the site contents view, you'll notice that everything that I have here on the left navigation pane is derived in some part from the site contents of Project Central. Now that said, it's also a little messy. And we may not necessarily need to put everything that's in site contents here on the quick launch. The top links bar, on the other hand, is generally used for external content. Now I don't mean just external like Google or Yahoo News. I mean external like not this site. 
So in this example, you'll notice that project red, blue, green, and tea leaf, all sites that we created as subsites underneath project central are all part of the top links bar, indicating that when we click on them, it takes us to locations outside of the site we are currently in. So that's a key distinction between the two. Now, do you have to follow those rules? No, but the tools that Microsoft provides to help us manage both the quick launch navigation here on the left-hand side and the top links bar at the top portion of the screen are explicitly designed to make it easier for us if we follow those rules. Now, there's a couple of different trains of thought in the world of SharePoint as to how we should utilize links. But generally, not just the distinction between local navigation versus our global navigation, but also in terms of what we decide to put in, let's say, the quick launch, for example. When you click on something like central documents, it takes you directly into a document library. But as we've talked about in previous videos, dropping a user into a list or a library with no context tends to cause problems because users don't know what to do or likewise how to do it. So it might be in our best interests as site admins to remove the possibility that users will easily and accidentally drop themselves into lists and libraries directly. Instead, it might be in our best interests to put them on pages that have the specific context necessary in order to know what to do when in a specific area. So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna edit the links of our quick launch and we're gonna remove everything except for home. Now, of course, you'll notice the recycle bin cannot be removed. That's for your own good because if you remove the recycle bin, users will never find it. They're not gonna know to look in the gear insight contents. So the recycle bin stays. But we are gonna leave the home button as well because the home button to get home locally is valuable. And I'm gonna go ahead and click save. So now that I've removed all those extra links, and by the way, you can always add them back later. We'll talk about how in just a moment. But what I'd like to do is I would like to add some pages to this quick launch. Now you could go find those pages and then click edit links and add the link and paste the URL. But that sounds super tedious. There's gotta be a better way, right? There is. To add pages to the quick launch navigation, first and foremost, go to the site pages library. To get into the site pages library, click on the gear in the top right corner and go to site contents. Here in site contents, find the site pages library. There it is right there. Once you found the site pages library, go ahead and find the page you'd like to add to the quick launch. In this case, I'd like to add the project info to the quick launch. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and click the ellipses to the right of project info, and you'll notice the option add to navigation is here on the ellipses. You could have also right clicked on it. You could have also clicked on the ellipses at the top by selecting the check mark and then click add to navigation any number of different ways this will work. So however you choose to do it, go ahead and find a page and add it to the navigation. Once it's been added, you can easily click and drag to shuffle things around as need be. I'll go ahead and add two more. Not bad. So from here, I'm gonna go ahead and click on the home button and let's take a look at how it looks. Not bad. So there's my home page. Now I've got my project info page, which if you'll remember, we built in an earlier video. My project document page. And my site documents page. Pretty cool. Customizing the quick launch navigation doesn't have to be an act of frustration. It can be really easy if you know how to do it. Now I did promise you I would show you how to add lists and libraries back. Uh, so let's use the project proposals library as an example of adding it back. Simply find the list or library here in site contents that you would like to add back, click the ellipses, and go to settings. Now, of course, there are other ways to get into the settings of lists and libraries, but we'll stick with this one for now. 
And sure enough, here inside list, name, and up, oh, navigation, we're going to find the toggle to display this on the quick launch. So if you feel comfortable putting the occasional list in library here in the quick launch, it's easy to do. Simply say yes, click save, and there it is. So go ahead and pause the video. Add a few pages to your quick launch and then double back and add one or two lists or libraries back to the quick launch to see how it looks. Make sure that you're putting yourself in the shoes of the user. So hopefully you're starting to see that customizing the quick launch doesn't have to be hard. As long as you know where the tools are, it's relatively easy to take control and make it look good. Now, on that note, let's turn our attention to the top links bar. Managing and editing the top links bar is not nearly as easy or powerful for that matter. It's a relatively simplistic endeavor. When you create a new site, it asks whether or not you'd like to add that site to the top links. If you choose no, that's it. It won't add it to the top links and there's no setting for you to do so after the fact. You can always edit the links, of course. And likewise, if you do rename a site, uh, do keep in mind that it's not gonna change the name in the top links bar. So you'll need to change that yourself later. That said, managing things here in the actual main interface using edit links can feel a little messy and you might like a little bit more room to work and a little bit more space to see what it is that you're actually working with. So on that note, we can jump into site settings. Here in site settings, you have access to tools that allow you to manage the quick launch, the top links bar and navigational elements. In this instance, what we're gonna go ahead and do is click on top link bar. You'll see here that it really is just this. You can add new links as you see fit. You can also change the order with relative ease. Simply by clicking on change order and renumbering, maybe you'd like to put project tea leaf at the top, and by top we mean the left, and click OK. You'll notice that doing so does put project tea leaf here on the far left hand side. Easy. Beyond that, of course, adding a new link is as easy as clicking new navigation link. From here, you can add the web address, type the name that you would like to appear here, and you're good to go. So go ahead and take this opportunity. If you haven't already, add a universal help tool link to your top links. Remember, simply type the web address or copy and paste it. Remember to leave that HTTP and type a description and click OK. We do have some additional advanced feature sets that are available to help us manage the quick launch. Here in site settings, if you jump into navigational elements, you'll see that you have the ability to both enable and disable the quick launch by unchecking enable quick launch and selecting OK. You'll see that the quick launch is removed entirely. So you may not necessarily feel like you need that left navigation pane. Of course, if you need that space back, you'll know that you can't remove the quick launch and have that do the trick. You'll need to change the look to the Oslo site layout style. What you might have also noticed in navigation elements was the ability to enable something called the tree view. By turning on the tree view, this actually builds out tree based structure of this entire site collection. So you can see from the top down the site you're currently in all of its lists and libraries, as well as any subsites. And if you expand the arrows to the left, those sites lists and libraries as well. Now, of course, if you haven't necessarily considered what your tree structure might look like, this can easily become a very overwhelming way to navigate. So choose this one wisely. I generally use the tree view when I'm building sites so that I can see where I am and easily jump from site to site quickly. But as a user navigation tool, uh, you may find it lacking. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off tree view and turn on quick launch and click OK. Go ahead and pause the video and try out tree view for yourself. Turn on and off the quick launch. See how it feels. We'll see you after the break. One final note regarding the quick launch. When you jump into the site settings quick launch section, just like with the top links bar section, It'll look predominantly as if it's built to just be another place for us to add new links. 
But there is an interesting little bit of feature hiding here. You'll notice that there are actually three links at the top. Of course, change order and new heading. But we also have access to something called the new navigation link. So when you're organizing your content here on the left-hand side, everything is by default organized at the top tier level, which is to say everything is on the same level as the next item. But what you can do is you can actually create new navigation links within these headings. Each default link provided here on the quick launch is a heading when you add it manually. But when you click new navigation link, you can actually specify, we'll go ahead and just put a URL here, not just a new link, but you can specify under which heading is it related. So I can put this project details link underneath the heading project info and click OK. And when you do, you'll notice that project details actually collapses underneath project info. I've created a navigation link underneath a heading. Let me go ahead and add one more for good measure. I'm going to go ahead and click on new navigation link. We'll go ahead and just use Google again here. And we'll call this one the project mission. Once again, we'll put that underneath project info and click OK. Pretty cool. I can change the order if I need to, but if I go home, you'll see I can now tell pretty definitively that project details and project mission are sub pages underneath project info. This is a pretty powerful way to provide users not just context for what they need to do, but where it is that they are and how it relates to the other content here in a site. Go ahead and pause the video. Add a new navigational link into your quick launch. Change the order. We'll see you after the break. Thanks for watching. Don't forget we also offer live classes in office applications, professional development, and private training. Visit learnit.com for more details. Please remember to like and subscribe and let us know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for choosing Learnit.